today we have um, a wonderful speaker, Richard Thigpen. Uh, from, uh, he is the Vice President for State and Government Affairs for PSENG. And uh, Richard is a, uh, among, well, many things actually. Among his title as VP at PSENG, he's also a lawyer, campaign strategist, and public policy expert. And we'll be speaking with you today on um, the 14th Amendment as it pertains to voter rights. Okay. Krista, did you want to have some remarks? Or? Okay. So without further ado, then, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Richard Thigpen. Thank you, Gary. You're all right. Okay. Uh, let me start by saying good afternoon, thanking Peter Woolley for having me here today, and hopefully I will give you all something to think about. The 14th Amendment, Voting Rights and Beyond, is a topic today. And my job today is to give you something new to think about the 14th Amendment, and really, you know, there's a debate about voting rights going on today, which has really been going on a long time, if you put it in a historical context. And I'm going to, I think I'll end by asking that question, is what's happening, and I think in Voting rights in 2013 different than what happened in 1898 and some years before that. The answer is somewhat different. So I want to start with a little visual for you guys. How many people have been to Capitol Hill? Most everybody, right? So I want to uh, start by giving you a visual to think about the next time you go to Washington. Notice the Supreme Court building. I don't know if you know Capitol Hill, but uh, you know, there's the I always forget which side is, and the downhill side is where they swear in presidents, and the other side is where, you know, is where you enter for the uh, House and the Senate. Across the street on this side is the Library of Congress, I'm sorry, over here are the offices for the House of Representatives, the other side is the office for the United States Senate. Over here is the Library of Congress, and then right over here is the United States Supreme Court building which in itself is a whole story. I'm a history buff at heart, and I won't go into that whole story, but it's in itself is a whole story, and it was built to there in the 1930s. But across the main entrance to the United States Supreme Court, which more than symbolically, I want to say to you, sits sort of above the Capitol building looking at it, is the slogan, Equal Justice Under Law. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before, and I want you to think about that. And so I, I you know, I noticed it being a history buff, and so I looked on the Supreme Court website. And on the website it says, these words written above the main entrance to the Supreme Court building express the ultimate responsibility of the Supreme Court of the United States. The court is the highest tribunal in the nation for all cases and controversies arising under the Constitution or the laws of the United States. As the final arbiter of the law, the court is charged with ensuring the American people the promise of equal justice under law and thereby also function as guardian and interpreter of the Constitution, the highest tribunal in the nation. So I, I start by saying equal justice under law actually is something that means a lot to all of us. It, is, it symbolizes what justice and the law are supposed to provide in this country. And then I'm going to step back to say to you that it is the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which is ratified, I think, officially on July 20th, I believe it was 1868, that made that possible. It's not something to be taken for granted. This didn't just happen overnight. And I have the words up here to have you look at them as we talk about this history. And I, I'm a true lover of this history, and so I want to talk about it just a little bit. But that last sentence is certainly the one that has proven to be the most important. Nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And making sure that the law treats you and you equally is one of the most fundamental elements of fairness, isn't it? It's very hard not to be fair if I have to treat you and you the same way. It becomes much easier to be unfair when I can say, well, you know, you have, your hair's kind of red or you wear glasses, and so for that reason there's going to be special rules for you. And that is, as we know, unfortunately, part of the history of our country. So the 14th Amendment is my love. The history of the 14th Amendment is my love. It, 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 I'm sorry. In the introduction, it was mentioned, you know, I am, I'll say another word for what I am. I'm a corporate lobbyist now. I am a lobbyist for public service. It's the name of my company. And that means I am a state government lobbyist. I spend time in the state house and in the state capitol, but also in city halls around the state trying to advance the agenda of the, of the company. It's a very complicated, wide-ranging agenda. Wide -ranging agenda. And years before, I was called a Democratic act activist. I have worked with Peter and Joe Calvinelli is here who does polling. 
And so politics is really my heart and soul and my specialty. So I'm going to try to mix these couple of messages today and hopefully give you all something to think about the 14th Amendment in a new way. But think about that. The Supreme Court building has this equal justice under law over it, and it purposefully, purposefully looks out over the House of the People, where the House and the Senate meet. And it really speaks a lot about our country. And I'll dare to say to you all, it's something we're all really proud of. It's what makes our country maybe the best country in the whole world, equal justice under law. And you tell me if you think differently as we, as we talk about that today. I think today probably same-sex marriage is perhaps the highest profile issue where the 14th Amendment continues to work its way in this country. Now, some of us like it and some of us don't like it, and that's a different subject about whether or not we think it's good, but most people think that treating people the same and not having distinction, not having distinction on how the law applies to people is, is by and large a great thing for this country. So introducing the concept of equality into our Constitution when the 14th Amendment got ratified is what officially launched the country we love today. And the story about how the, how the world's first republic, the world's first republic, the United States of America, was born as a slaveholding republic, became the first republic in the world to make everyone equal before the law, is one of the greatest political stories ever told, and rarely told from what I can see. This transformation was paid in blood because this transformation was made possible by our civil war, and well over 650,000 lives were lost during it. But it's what made our country, and what has made our country, the gold standard for democracy around the world. How many people in this room come from another country? Ancestry. Only one. It must be in Morris County. That was a bad joke. I'm joking. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm, I'm very surprised. And everybody knows what I'm talking about. In New Jersey, you know, our state is, is one of the most diverse states in, in the country. And certainly, I think it's over one in five households, close to one in four now, are, are, are foreign born, let alone have ancestry that's foreign born. And I work in public service. How many people are Italian of descent, Irish descent, Eastern European descent in my company? It's, it's close to a majority. So I'm very surprised to see that. But you understand what I'm saying. We are the gold standard for democracy in the world. And people have come from all over the world to be here because democracy and freedom go together. And we're going to talk about that a little more also. And the other point of this is, you know, today's February 25th. This great accomplishment is a Black History Month story. And most people, I, I want to make people think about Black History Month a little differently as well, because it's not about a separate part of American history. It's really about American history, and that Black history is to make us understand how full and diverse our history is. And look at what this new birth of freedom in America has done for the entire planet. It is arguable since. France in 1917 launched the American century, that freedom has been carried all around the world and that our standard of freedom is all over the world now. And it all starts with the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment started with the surrender of General Lee at Appomattox, which I'll use as our symbolic start. So, the idea of equality has been here since the very founding of our country, but not the reality. As you know, as I said, we were founded as a slaveholding republic. You had to own property to vote. Women could not vote. Our country, you know, the Know Nothing Party in the 1850s was about Irish in politics. Too many Irish in politics in America. There's been times in America when new people have not been accepted. So Thomas Jefferson said in his first inaugural, all two will bear in mind this sacred principle that although the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail, that will to be rightful must be reasonable, that the minority possess their equal rights, which equal laws must protect, and to violate would be oppression. Beautiful words, but they were spoken by a slaveholder. And not only a slaveholder, but the political leader of a whole plantation aristocracy. You know, he's the greatest politician our country's produced, I think, arguably, is Thomas Jefferson. And him and his disciples won six in a row elections. They lost one in 1796 by Whisker. But it, it's a tremendous political accomplishment. But the gentleman spoke about equality. But equality was an ideal, but it was never a reality until after the Civil War. Civil War started when the losers of the 1816, 1860 presidential election decided to secede. Hear what I just said? Presidential politics plays a part, as certainly in my thinking, but it plays a part in our thinking in terms of how politics have played out in this country. 
And it was without a doubt, from the point of view of those people who succeeded, a very bad decision, notwithstanding you still hear people to this day wave Confederate flags. They paid as heavy a price as you could possibly pay for any decision, and yet some today still seem proud of it. You know, and New Jersey had a part of this history. You know, Abraham Lincoln was the second ever Republican president for candidate the United, you know, for president of the United States, and he won with a very low percentage, 41 percent of the vote, a very narrow victory in a four-way race. The first Republican presidential candidate was John C. Fremont in 1856, and his vice presidential candidate was a guy named William Dayton from Freehold, New Jersey, a United States senator from our state. So, you know, and when the 1860 presidential election came around, I bet you didn't know this, you know, the Republican Party was new. And in 1859, the Republicans got the Speaker of the House. That controlled the House of Representatives. They got control of the House of Representatives, and guess who it was? His name was William Pennington, and he was a lawyer from Norton, New Jersey. And he was a former governor of our state. He is also the, fir the first, and I think until Tom Foley repeated defeat, the only Speaker of the House to lose for re-election. He was a first-term congressman, Speaker of the House, when Abraham Lincoln ran and lost it, uh, running for re-election. You know, Abraham Lincoln won the 1864 election against a guy from West Orange, New Jersey, George McClellan. So the Civil War was won on the battlefield, and sometimes we don't pay enough attention to what they were dealing with at the time to understand how the 14th Amendment happened. You know, uh, Ab uh, Robert E. Lee surrendered on April 9th, and on April 15th, Lincoln was killed. Have any of you ever heard the words that got Abraham Lincoln killed? Isn't that a funny statement? You know, I read Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, Team of Rivals, and at the very end of that book she talks about it. I'm going to read it to you because it fits into our topic perfectly. He gave his last speech on April 11th, made in Washington, D.C., after the South had surrendered. And here's what he said. It is, it is also unsatisfactory to some that the elective franchise is not given to the colored man. I would prefer myself that it were now conferred on the very intelligent and on those who serve our cause as soldiers. John Wilkes, Booth, John Wilkes Booth was in the audience, and Doris Kearns Goodwin reports his quote as, nigger voting means nigger equality. That'll be the last speech he ever gives. So I say that to say voting rights is a big deal in our country, and you don't, never, and you don't first off think about voting rights and equality together. John Wilkes Booth, by the way, was a, you know, he signed the New York Times two weeks after he assassinated Lincoln, published a letter by John Wilkes Booth, written the November before. My love is for the South alone, nor do I deem it a dishonor attempt to make for her a prisoner of the man to whom she owes so much misery, signed a Confederate doing his duty upon his own responsibility. So politics matter to me. And you know, so the 14th Amendment came alive because of a very challenging situation in our country. And it was about how to deal with the rebellion. People don't think about it. And so how to deal with this rebellion of southern states, think about it. They have lost a war. They've been militarily defeated on the battlefield. And you have 11 states in the south. And what do you do with them? Well, the overwhelming desire was to bring them back into the union. And so you know, they had a, you know, so it's not quite that simple because of politics, which I'll talk about. You know, there was, uh, when the war was over, Congress appointed a congressional committee to study reconstruction and investigate the conditions in the South because of what was going on. And of course, there was a New Jerseyan on that committee. He was from Sussex County. And his name was in, oops, what could I did? Andrew Jackson Rogers. And he was in a, he was like New Jersey at the time. He was pro slavery, but also pro union. So, I'm going to read you a, a, a brief part. I did yeah, a nice job. I, I clicked it closed. <laughs> so you're right. If I close it all the way, there you go. i got to keep it open. Keep right. it open okay. So, all right. So I just want to talk a little bit about the, uh, what they saw. And guess what? This was all about politics at the time. And so I'm going to read you just a little bit from that report, but I want you to follow me. I think this will make it clear on how voting rights and, and equality are so hand in hand in this country up to this very day. When all become free, representation for all necessarily follows. If you remember in the Constitution, those who were slaves were counted as three-fifths of a man for purposes of representatives in Congress and electoral votes in the 
in the Electoral College. As a consequence, the inevitable effect of the rebellion would be to increase the political power of the insurrectionary states whenever they should be allowed to resume their place in the, in the uh, Union. As representation is by the Constitution based upon population, your committee did not think it advisable to change that. The increase of representation necessarily resulting from the abolition of slavery was considered the most important element in the change conditions of affairs, and the necessity for some fundamental action in this regard was imperative. So they were faced with the fact of understanding that these southern states were going to have more representatives come back in. A very complicated scenario, and I want to go into too much deal, but they were faced with the fact that these southern states needed to be reintegrated into the Union, and how do you do it? So they came up with a very simple formula that caused a lot of controversy. You disenfranchise those who participated in the rebellion and couldn't be trusted, and you give the vote to these newly freed slaves who'd stayed loyal to the Union, and that's what put together the southern states back into the Union and allowed them to have voting, right, which is the fundamental of America, but also be loyal to the country. So it wasn't about race or it wasn't about preference, it was about security, peace and security for our country. And we could really talk about that in a long time. And you know, the southern states didn't go along with this willingly. And I just want you to understand, in 1866, there were 242 members in the House, 94 came from those Confederate states, 24 of those 94 were based on the population of African Americans in the South. Like 242, 94, and 24. So it's a significant amount of political power that we're talking about. And so they decided to allow blacks to be a part of the voting population and to help reorganize those states. So in about 1867, they passed the Reconstruction Act, which gave them the steps to get back into the Union, the Southern states. One of them was ratifying the 14th Amendment. But they began a process where they registered about 750,000 African American voters for the first time across the South. And it was, trying to, it was trying to fight Reconstruction that really got Andrew Jackson impeached, not some of the other things I've heard people talk about. New Jersey, in 1867, overwhelmingly passed, the legislature overwhelmingly passed a resolution opposed to black suffrage. So they made it possible for blacks to vote in the South, but blacks were not allowed to vote in the North because this was about political necessity, not about anything else, right? So, and you know, back to my favorite topic, politics. You know, every African-American office holder was Republican at that time. And you know, it was, Lyndon Johnson in 1964 is the first Southerner to be elected to the White House after the Civil War, which kind of gives you an impact on how Americans actually view what was done then. And I could talk about how many Democrats and Republicans got elected. So the 1868 presidential election comes, and it's Ulysses S. Grant, the general who, who won the war, versus Horatio Seymour, the former governor of New York. Grant wins by 300,000 votes. It was the black vote in 1868 that got Ulysses Grant elected president. So equality and voting rights go hand to hand in our country. If I can take away your right to vote, I can take away your right, I can begin to take away more and more of your rights. If you have the right to vote, it really impacts our, 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 on the government. So, so I'm gonna keep going. So, so the black vote elected Grant we ratified the 14th Amendment. Right after that, we ratified the 15th Amendment, and I, it, it, you know, which uh, guaranteed that you know, the right to vote could not be denied by race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So in 1870, the first African American named Hiram Revels, a minister, went into the United States Senate. And you know what seat he took in the United States Senate? He took the seat of Jefferson Davis, who had left the Senate in 1861 to become president of the Confederacy. Quite a symbolic statement, really, right there. It, it, more than any words I could give you. So the New York Herald, I kind of like this phrase, but hopefully you all can take my, appreciate my sense of humor, wrote an article, and they call Hiram Rebels the distinguished darky. And he was the first of the original seven African Americans to go into the House of Representatives. And I just say that to say, you know, that's, that's America. It's, it, you know, it is what it is, but that's what they called him. And people got the message right away, voting and equal rights are connected to each other directly. That's what the Ku Klux Klan was formed about, and that's where they focused most of their physical intimidation during that period, was on making sure these newly freed blacks did not vote. 
And then we go into my other life, which is as a lawyer, and I just cover these briefly. You know, the 14th Amendment, you can read, I'm, I'm doing very good with this, I apologize, but you can read the words about equal protection of the laws, right? Today we say equal justice, we're all proud of it. So in 1883, first off, there was the civil rights cases, and the Supreme Court said private individuals were immune from the 14th Amendment and that redress could only be found in federal courts except in cases where state governments officially announced their intention to discriminate which, you know, you, you don't do that often. So in 1896 comes another famous case, Plessy versus Ferguson. You heard of that one? So Plessy versus Ferguson happens because of the Louisiana separate car law passed in 1890, the Louisiana separate car law mandating separate but equal accommodations for white and colored passengers on railroads. Separate. But, you know, so hence the separate but equal talk, which is, is maybe not exactly factual. Supreme Court held that the 14th Amendment does not prohibit the enforced separation of the races known as separate but equal. We think that the enforced separation of the races as applied to the internal commerce of the state neither abridges the privilege or immunities of the colored man, nor denies him the equal protection of the laws within the meaning of the 14th Amendment. That's the Supreme Court said that, right? So, you know, I, 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 I wonder if you know this. The 14th Amendment, I'm sorry, the Plessy versus Ferguson was a test case. The Citizens Committee to Oppose the Separate Car Law formed in New Orleans. You know, railroad companies didn't like the separate car law because it cost them money. They had to have two problems. One is they had to have separate cars. Even if you had 20, you know, 20 people, you could fit them in one car, you have a separate car so you could divide the races. Two is somebody's got to pick who's black and white. And that ain't pretty, as you know. And, and how about when there's a family? You got to separate families. So the threat of violence was really for these conductors, right? separating families, deciding who's black and who's not black. And so they joined in this. They found a gentleman named Homer Plessy to ride the train and to purposely get arrested so they could challenge this law. They knew separate but equal violated the 14th Amendment, the Citizens Committee. They knew it. They were positive this was going to work. Homer Plessy gets arrested and he gets uh, sent to uh, the criminal court in the city of New Orleans and he hears it's in front of Judge John Ferguson. That case ends up before the Supreme Court as Plessy versus Ferguson, which, as I just read to you, is held that the enforced separation of the races as applied to the internal commerce of the state does not abridge the privileges or meanings of the colored man. So they lost, and they were quite surprised and quite disappointed. But as you know, this journey continued for our country, and that's, what the, that's the beauty of this amendment, this journey continued. Then in 1898, it got even better. Williams versus Mississippi. Henry Williams was indicted and tried and convicted of murder by an all-white jury and had been sentenced to be hanged. He challenged the conviction on the grounds that, the black, that blacks had been unconstitutionally excluded from Mississippi jury pools. The juror pool was restricted to voters, and by that time, only whites were voters. The reason that voters were only white was the disenfranchisement caused by a new constitutional requirement. They called the Constitutional Convention in Mississippi in 1890, all part of, I'll tell you in a minute what that was all part of. And they passed a requirement for a poll tax and a literacy, and a literacy test to be, uh, in order for you to vote. So Henry Williams facing hanging, obviously who tries to try the law. So Mississippi just held a Constitutional Convention had 134 delegates, one was black. The next governor of Mississippi had a famous quote, which is in the record in the case. It, and you know what he said? The reason they held the Constitutional Convention? To get the nigger out of politics, it was a famous quote. The Mississippi electorate before that convention had been 190,000 registered black and 69,000 white. I'm not making that up, you guys. That's in the record in the Supreme Court case. It shocked me when I read it. So that is what led to this case. The delegates rewrote the Constitution requiring all voters as of 1892 to pass a literacy test. Williams claimed this violated the 14th Amendment because the law was merely a scheme to disenfranchise black voters. Held by the Supreme Court, the use of poll taxes and literacy tests as qualifications to vote is not prohibited by the 14th Amendment. They do not on their face discriminate between the races, this law, the poll tax law. And it has been shown that their actual administration, uh, it has not been shown that their actual administration was evil, only that the evil was possible underneath them. That was the majority opinion in Williams versus Mississippi in 1898. So the courts 
it didn't quite take equal protection to mean what we mean it today. It's been, it's been a journey and a struggle, and it's had huge political consequences. You know, there were African Americans during Reconstruction elected to Congress. The last one was named George White in North Carolina in 1896. No African Americans were in Congress until 1929. I, and and um, he gave the famous speech about, you know, like the phoenix, we shall rise from the ashes as he departed the House of Representatives. So both what the gentleman said in Mississippi uh, and what happened indicates that politics and equality go hand in hand. If you don't have the right to vote and, and participate in politics, you can't obviously be equal. So just saying those words is not so significant, it's not in itself so significant. And I want to add, you know, in world, you know, 1917, once again, a governor of New Jersey, excuse me, the only governor of New Jersey is in the White House. His name is Woodrow Wilson. He runs for a second term, and those of political trivia, forgive me, Woodrow Wilson is the last successful presidential candidate to fail to carry his home state. New Jersey did not vote for Woodrow Wilson in 1916, but he won by a whisker. The last candidate to fail to carry his home state. So, 1970 comes, everybody knows what's going on in Europe, right? There's a little difference between the Germans and the French, right? And ultimately, America gets dragged into the war. And when Woodrow Wilson gives his speech, he talks about there may, there are, it may be many months of fiery trial and sacrifice ahead of us. It is a fearful thing to lead this great peaceful people into war, into the most terrible and disastrous of all wars, civilization seeming to be in the, pal in the balance. But the right is more precious than peace, and we shall always fight for the things which we have always carried nearest our hearts, for democracy, he says. That's why we went into World War I. That was the rallying cry of America going into World War I. That was the launching of the American century winning in World War I, the peace in Versailles, I guess it was, is what began what we now know as the American century. And it was about democracy about, and about our own conception of ourselves as a country who upheld democratic principles. And I wonder if we didn't have that 14th Amendment, would we have simply gone into that war for a different reason? And I'll add one more. Anybody seen the World War II Memorial in Washington? Anybody go through that? Well, it caught my attention, you, you hear me. General Marshall has a quote. Anybody know General George Marshall, the Chief of Staff to the Army, the, the military advisor to President Roosevelt, has a quote on the wall at the World War II monument. We are determined that before the sun sets on this terrible struggle, our flag will be recognized throughout the world as a symbol of freedom on the one hand, freedom on the one hand, and of overwhelming force on the other. I'll leave the second part out, overwhelming force, but of freedom. It is our conception, I think everybody in this room would recognize it. We are carrying, we carried freedom around the world during World War II. Certainly, the modern Japan and modern Germany, can we have any doubt about what America did? They vote for their Japanese prime minister and German chancellor. There's no question, before the war, the Japanese nor the Germans were democratic. We brought democracy to those great places. So I say that to say that it is such an integral part of our country. And then I'll go back to the man who I talked about, the first Southerner to occupy the White House since the end of the Civil War in 1865 is my own hero, I hope you guys don't get mad at me, Lyndon Baines Johnson. You know, he won 61.1% of the popular vote in the 1964 presidential election. You know what that makes him? The all-time winner, the highest popular vote percent getter in the history of our country. Arguably, James Monroe in 1820, who was unopposed, got more, but he didn't have an opponent. So a really a remarkable achievement. So if you remember Lyndon Johnson, I think you know where I'm heading. I'm heading for the Voting Rights Act, and I'm going to talk, and here I go. You know, on March 15, 1865, he went before Congress to give a speech. That was very shortly, I can't give you the number of days, after the famous March on Selma, which was for Voting Rights Act. There was a civil rights movement and people were agitating for civil rights. And the response of the people in Alabama to those peaceful demonstrators, what they did with those police mowing them over, touched the whole country. And it touched the President of the United States, who comes from Texas. And he knew, he knew the South. He talked many times about being a son of the South. And his speech is really something else. Tonight I speak for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. 
To deny a man his hopes because of his color or race, his religion or the place of his birth, is not only to do injustice, it is to deny America and to dishonor the dead who gave their lives for American freedom. Many of the issues of civil rights are very complex and most difficult, but about this there can and should be no argument. Every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. That was the speech the president gave before he introduced the Voting Rights Act of 1965 into the Congress of the United States and it was passed several months later. And that speech is very significant because it, it talked about, it's talked about in a case that was decided last June by our Supreme Court. Shelby County versus, Shelby County, which is in Alabama, versus Holder, the Attorney General of the United States. Petitioner Selby County sought a declaratory judgment that sections four and five of the Voting Rights Act are facially unconstitutional. So section four was the one about all these southern states who've had a history of excluding people, poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses. You've gotta get pre-cleared before you can change your voting procedure by the Justice Department, before you can do redistricting or, or institute other changes, right? That's section four of the Voting Rights Act. That's what was held facially unconstitutional. And by the way, uh, by a five to four vote, section four of the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional. This is what the Supreme Court said. Its formula can no longer be used as a basis to subject jurisdictions to preclearance. Very impressive, you guys, I'm sorry. I thought I turned that off, man, I apologize. Texas announced shortly after that decision that its voter identification law, anybody notice those discussions going on these days? Had that had been blocked by the Justice Department would take effect immediately. So that was June 25th, 2013. In the New York Times, they wrote an article about this and Justice Roberts was interviewed. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was one of the towering legislative achievements of the civil rights movement and Chief Justice Roberts said it's, called it strong medicine was the right response to entrenched racial discrimination. When it was first enacted, he said, black voter registration stood at 6.4% in Mississippi. And the gap between black and white registration was more than 60 percentage points. So that's what the Voting Rights Act of 1965 did. It made a lot possible that was not possible in the past. Then he goes on to say, however, in the 2004 election, the last before the law was reauthorized, the black registration rate in Mississippi was 76% almost four percentage higher points higher than the white rate. In the 2012 election, Justice Roberts wrote, African-American voter turnout exceeded white voter turnout in five of the six states originally covered by Section 4. The Chief Justice recalled the Freedom Summer of 64 with civil rights workers Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner, who were murdered near Philadelphia, Mississippi for registering people to vote. Today, Chief Justice Roberts wrote, both of those towns Philadelphia, Mississippi, and I don't know the other one, Selma, are governed by African-American mayors. Problems remain in these states and others, but there is no denying that due to the Voting Rights Act, our nation has made great strides. So voting rights and equality are a key part of our democracy. I think everybody accepts that and everybody recognizes, I know everybody does campaigns recognize when you don't vote, you don't count. And if you can't vote, it's different than when you don't vote. We all talk about young people, I'm looking at Joe back there, because we've talked about turnout models are an essential part of every politician's campaign and understanding what's gonna happen. But if you can't vote, you really don't matter, do you? And if you can't vote, I can pass a law that's saying red-haired people can't earn above $20,000 a year, say. $10,000 a year, right? Or women, and we know we have problems already, are gonna earn less than men. So. I personally am extremely proud of the Voting Rights Act. I've tried to cover briefly without putting you to sleep a little bit of the history. It's really fascinating history, the Civil War history and how this right came about, how this act came about. It didn't come easily. It came at the most gravest time with the greatest sacrifice by people in our country. And now today we are still debating the Voting Rights Act. And the Supreme Court just eliminated one of the key parts of the Voting Rights Act saying, oh, we're done. And I will go back to say that in 1898, the Supreme Court's talked about in Mississippi what they were doing with changing the voting laws is take the nigger out of politics, right? And here we are in 2014, and look who's in the White House. 
I consider that no greater tribute to our country than the struggle we've been through, and look where we are today. It's a beautiful thing. It doesn't take away from the fact we have ways to go. It doesn't take away from the fact there's lots of political issues that go with voting that need to be addressed. Voter identification laws are one of them. You know, you wonder, first off, what's the problem they're solving with voter identification laws? And I'm gonna ask you that question. As I said, I'm gonna end with this thought. Our voter identification laws in Shelby County, is that totally different than Williams versus Mississippi? I think everybody can say it's mostly different, right? Nobody thinks this is 1898 Mississippi in America today, but is it totally different, really? The stakes about who votes are the highest possible stakes in this country. Not only is Barack Obama in the White House, but in 2004, he's the, he got more votes than any man who's ever run for president of the United States has ever gotten, Barack Obama. And when you think about where we came from and you think about what I just said to you, that's no little tribute to what a great country we live in and how it's continually able to renew itself and how we should all thank the Lord for our 14th Amendment. I want you to recognize this is an appropriate month to talk about it as in Black History Month because it's got an integral part, African-American struggle for freedom and its role in making America safe from the slaveholder-led rebellion, which we now call a civil war, hear me? A slaveholder-led rebellion. They wage war against our government. It was African-Americans who helped save our country from the greatest peril it's ever faced. It's a Black History Month story. And I think we should feel better and prouder of that, not strange about it. And I'm not sure, Joe, you, I, I'll look at you. Has there ever been an election where 100% voter turnout has occurred? But that's obviously a goal. Anybody who opposes that goal, I'd, I'd like to have a little talk with them about their commitment to democracy, right? It's a beautiful thing. Joe, you oppose that? They, they had 100% voter turn this old Soviet Union, right. Oh, you're going to vote. Trust me, you're going to vote, right. That's one way to get it done, right? So, so voting rights, equality, freedom, the nature of our country, a representative democracy. You know, they talk about, after the Civil War and the 14th Amendment, one of the greatest achievements of the 14th Amendment is to finally, as they say, fix the foundation of our government on consent of the governed. Everybody gets a chance to vote. That's what makes us a great country not only certain people who have certain characteristics. So I could go on and on, and I could especially talk to you about, you know, New Jersey and Civil War politics is a very interesting story. Aside from Andrew Jackson Rogers, who, uh, who uh, um, was a member of Congress from Sussex County, who was very opposed to the 14th Amendment. You know, New Jersey ratified the 13th by the Republicans. 13th Amendment abolished slavery. It was passed right after the war was over. It was a way, to, if you've seen the movie, to finally make sure that rebellion never comes back again and we never face this existential peril for our country. Well, New Jersey ratified it. Then the Democrats got in power because you know why? Because the mid 1862 elections, there was that little emancipation proclamation that Abraham Lincoln had passed and New Jersey voters didn't like it. They voted the Republicans out and they put the Democrats in. And so the Democrats were running New Jersey in 1865. In, okay, okay, so that was one of the problems. So, so New Jersey ratified it because, you know, there was a big, uh, it was the word halo effect of winning the war. After the war is over, the Democrats come into office again. And they try to take away that ratification. Same thing on the 14th Amendment. The Republicans ratified it. The Democrats came into office in 18... The last Republican governor until 1895 for 30 years in New Jersey tried to override the veto of the Democrats in the legislature who wanted to repeal, the, who wanted to rescind the ratification of the 14th Amendment. So our state was always pro-slavery and pro-union, which sounds different. We rallied to the cause when the governor called troops to, together because the Confederates invaded Pennsylvania. We gotta go help Pennsylvania. You ever think about that? I never really thought about that until I read it. That's pretty close to New Jersey, yes sir. They split. They split. Northern Jersey went for Lincoln. Southern Jersey went again. I think that's Lincoln never carried New Jersey. He won electoral votes in 1860. Lincoln never carried New Jersey. And when 1864, when he ran against George McClellan, well, George McClellan's from West Orange. So guess what? The guy from West Orange carried New Jersey, not Abraham Lincoln. Right. So that is a, you know, but New Jersey was very strongly Democratic. And from the end of the war, except for that a little bump because of the military victory, we elected Democratic governors 
until 1895. And that's another story, a guy named Garrett Hobart, who's got a statue in front of Patterson City Hall, was the Republican chairman who got a Republican <clears throat> governor elected of our state. He then became the running mate for William McKinley in 1896. And he somehow mysteriously died in office in 1899. And guess what they did? They got the governor of New York to be his running mate for his reelection. This guy named Teddy Roosevelt, you might have heard of. McKinley gets assassinated and history has changed. It could have been a guy from New Jersey is my point to you guys. So anyway, having said that, there's a very fascinating history in here. Um, voting rights is something that we should be extremely proud of. This debate is still going today. Hopefully I've made you think about, don't view the Shelby County in the debate you hear today without some sense of the past. The two are not directly the same, but they're, you cannot make the case they are completely disconnected from each other either. But we are nevertheless making progress. I know about voter suppression techniques today. In fact, we've talked about them. I know a lot about them. But none of them include violence, guns, shootings, hangings anymore. That used to be the stock and trade on how you control the voter. So controlling the voter is the way to control democracy. And so Hopefully I've given you all something to think about. Hopefully I've given you a Black History Month story and hopefully when you go to Washington, you will stop and look. They have a scaffold up and look at that Supreme Court building and notice equal justice under law facing the United States Capitol building. And you'll know why this is the greatest country in the world. It's right there in front of you and it's the most beautiful thing. Thank you all very much and hopefully I've inspired some questions. Yes, sir. Question on the ratification process before you present. Yes, sir. Take me through a state that was 1895 with surrender, absence, and repudiation. A Mississippi or a Georgia or Louisiana. What, was, what motivated them? Was that a precondition that they ratified this? Did yes, I'll tell you exactly. So, so, first off, right, 18, June of 1866, they. Uh, passed the 14th Amendment as a, you know, in Congress, right? Two-thirds vote in Cong both houses of Congress, then ratification by three-fourths of the states. That's the game. So every southern state rejected the 14th Amendment the first time they saw it by overwhelming majorities. That's what sent the signal, oh, we got to fix this problem, because if they come back in the Union and keep acting this way, they're going to start this war again, and we're going to be back in the same place we were, and we cannot allow that to happen to our country. So they, so they then uh, decided, okay, we're gonna pass the Reconstruction Act. We're gonna get rid of these, these uh, governments that were allowed by President Johnson. President Johnson took over when Abraham Lincoln got assassinated, right? He was the former senator from Tennessee, the only Southerner who didn't follow his state down to Montgomery, Alabama, then ultimately to Richmond, Virginia when they succeeded. He stayed loyal to the Union, was the military governor of Tennessee for a while. Abraham Lincoln decides he, he needs him for balance on the ticket in 64, so he puts Johnson on the ticket with him. Lincoln gets killed by Booth. And a story I bet nobody's heard before, the worries that got Lincoln killed, which is amazing to me. It's about voting. And so Johnson's the president of the United States, and he's a friend of the Southerners, it turns out. Big mistake by Abraham Lincoln to put him in office. So he allows these, he allows, as they say, notorious and unpardoned rebels to become the leaders of these southern states, the guys who, who waged the war and lost it, took over those southern states after the war. They all rejected the 14th Amendment. And, you know, if I can say it my way, they were like, oh, no, we're not going to let this happen. There's no way these guys are taking power and coming back into Congress. And as a Republican, they were all Democrats. So the Republicans won the war. Well, we didn't win this war to give it to the Democrats either. No, right? So they had to come up with a system that maintained Republican control, and that means Ulysses S. Grant in 1868. And they divided the South into military districts, and they required them to do state constitutions that allowed universal manhood suffrage, ladies at the time. It wasn't until when? 1920 that women were allowed to vote in this country. But we're on that march, you guys, right? Universal manhood suffrage, where they make them allow African Americans, that's where these first office holders came from, to form new, convent, new, uh, new constitutions for those states that, that had to mandate manhood suffrage, and then they, that constitution had to be ratified by the voters, right? And you had to ratify the 14th Amendment if you want to get readmitted to the Union. Otherwise, you're out in limbo, sitting with no representation. So, so that's what they did. In the northern states, it was a little bit different. 
Uh, they generally ratified the 14th Amendment, but they also did not have to deal with black suffrage. The idea of having blacks vote in the North was equally dis, well, that's not fair, was also distasteful. So it, it was a very interesting journey, and you know, in the right classroom, that journey from Congress passing in an 18, June of 1866 to ratification in July of 1868 includes the 1866 midterm elections, and the Republicans were, one of the reasons this is worded the way it is, they were scared to death of an all-white electorate in the 1866 midterm elections if they openly advocated for black voting. They knew they would lose, so they pulled it out, they wouldn't go that far, but they said equal protection, the next best thing. So it's a very interesting story on how they came about it, and you need to be a student of politics to really understand how we got there, right? So they were very concerned. The Republicans ended up with veto-proof majorities in both houses after the 1866 midterm elections, right? Really about treason versus loyalty. Democrats were associated with treason, whether we like it or not at the time. You know, only two Democratic presidents until FDR made into the White House. He was 1932. Democrats and treason were, elect, were, were associated. So it's a fascinating story, and it, it didn't come easily. So could you talk a little bit about, um, as an observer of the 14th Amendment and what the Supreme Court has said recently about it, could you talk a little bit about what you think are the likelihood, is the likelihood of Congress or the Justice Department doing something to effectively protect voting rights uh, despite what the Supreme Court has said about it? It is absolutely inevitable. The question is how long will it take? Now, nobody who pays attention to politics could think right now in the House of Representatives meaningful steps to protect voting rights are going to happen. It's too controversial. They're not going to do it. But the march of history is totally clear where we're headed. And you could say, well, look, I've heard people say it to me. Barack Obama's the president. You don't need a Voting Rights Act anymore. I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that one to you. Everybody's got their own opinion about it, right? But you do see voter identification laws, and those are notorious. The good things about voter identification laws is people who are doing it are pretending they're not doing it, right? Anybody ever hear them talk about it? Peter and Joe also know. I'll use New Jersey for an example. Non-white voters, 80% vote Democratic right now. Used to be Republican in the old days. So forget politics. If you want to win, if you're a Republican in New Jersey, the fewer non-white voters who vote, the more likely you can win. That doesn't take an evil person to embrace that logic, right? I want to win, man. I'm trying to win, right? And so it's there. But the short-term uh, prediction is probably a lot of difficulty. This five to four majority will change one day. But our country is getting probably more conservative right now, not more liberal. Does anybody agree with that? That's probably the way we're heading. But there is no question where we're heading. We have, an, we have the son of an African in the White House of the United States of America. My father, may he rest in peace, just passed away, 88 years old. You know, I, Rick, I never would have believed this could ever have happened. I'll never forget 2008 Election Day. I never would have believed in my wildest dreams this could have happened, right? And he meant it from the bottom of his heart. He was born when Calvin Coolidge was the President of the United States, if you put it that way, right? Never would have believed it could have happened, but look what happened. And he's the highest vote getter ever. 2008, 2000, 2008, as he's the highest vote getter ever. George Bush, I think, had the, told, had the, had the victory in 2004. So it, I believe it's inevitable that everybody is, that our democracy, which we are so proud of, is going to be based on everybody participating. The challenge is, you know, as a Republican in New Jersey, right, and I don't mean to sing, uh, attack that party, but there's a political incentive, you forget everything else. Used to be the other way around, as I said, the Republicans are the ones who brought about this. You know, Lyndon Johnson is one who made the solid South. You ever pay attention, you know, the solid South that I talked about, because all these Republican re office holders are reconstruction? 1968 is when it changed, the Solid South. The Solid South went Democratic in every presidential election until 1968 because of Lyndon Johnson and his Voting Rights Act. And he knew he was going to do He knew it was going to happen. So it's, not, it's no joke, but it's not about Democrat and Republican, is my point. So I, I, I viewed it as inevitable. I view it as going to be rough in the short term, but we're all going to win in the long term, and this country is going to be the shining beacon for the whole world, or continue to be. Well, yes, sir. I'm very happy that you haven't simplified American politics 
and American life. It's, it's, it's complex. Yes, sir. And, uh, and we need more. to understand that. Let's get back to Woodrow Wilson losing. Woodrow Wilson hires blacks in the federal government, put them in the back room to work, not in the front room. The uh, Democrats are behind him. The Republicans are not. Is there another layer that was responsible for his loss? Well, yes. So first off, Woodrow Wilson is a Virginian by birth. So he carried those racial views from his childhood in Virginia into the White House. And he did not like us African-Americans. He thought very lowly of us, thought we deserved to be segregated. You know, the, the president, president of Princeton University. Prince. President of Princeton University before he became governor of New Jersey, before he became president of the United States. You know, one of his signature achievements as governor, by the way, we're still mad about this public service. He created the Board of Public Utilities. That's a joke. He, he, he made a reputation as a reformer in regulating those big evil uh, utility companies is one of the things that helped catapult him into national attention as a reformer. So in 1912, Woodrow Wilson, in both elections, Woodrow Wilson got about 42% of the vote in New Jersey. 1912 when he carried New Jersey, 1916 when he didn't. 1912, there was a three-way race because former President Roosevelt, Republican, decides to challenge William Howard Taft, the incumbent president for the White House in 1912. So the Republican vote got split. It allowed a Democrat so I told you about Abraham Lincoln being the second lowest. The third lowest popular vote winner is Woodrow Wilson in 1912. He carried New Jersey with 42% of the vote. 1916, it's, one, it's a head-on, it's a one-on-one -on -one contest. He runs against Charles Evans Hughes, former governor of New York, uh, associate justice of the Supreme Court. And the chief justice of the Supreme Court, when they built this new building and put equal justice under law over the top of it, it was a Republican who put that on top, so don't confuse partisanship. He, he wiped Woodrow Wilson clean in New Jersey, got for over 55% of this vote in, in New Jersey. And I believe, when I gather, Wilson, you know, the reformer who regulated utilities, was also anti-boss. And apparently the Democrats didn't like that anti-boss thing in New Jersey. And he did very poorly in our state. And he, he, he eked out a last-minute victory in California, which enabled him to fail to carry his home state and still win. It was a very close election. But Woodrow Wilson was not a shining moment in race relations in America, our governor. He hated us, thought we were inferior, and, and spoke about it at times and took actions in support of that line of thinking. Yes, he was the president of Princeton University. You know, they were getting ready to you know, throw him out. You know what his out was when he was at Princeton? You know, they were getting sick of him. You know, we want to get rid of this guy. You know what he did? He ran for governor and he won. You can't make that up. And it worked. And then. You know, New Jersey, as I talk about, you know, only voted 42% for the guy. I mean, he won a big election in 1910 as governor, but he got 42% of the vote for president in 1912 in New Jersey. But he won because of what Theodore Roosevelt running against William Howard Taft. It's really, the truth is always much stranger than fiction is what I'm discovering when I study history. I, I just want to make a comment yes, on uh, the current president. I think you're a good example of why he won because if he was born prior to 1960, he would have been weighed down. You're not weighed down. You're able to look at the big picture. Born in 1960. It's funny you use that. Th that's good. <laughs> but right. in, in 1960, I was commissioned in the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. Twelve years after Eisenhower uh, integrated the Army, I went, uh, uh, pardon me, Truman integrated Great. the Army by executive order. Right. I went to Fort McCullen, Alabama. There's a big sign outside of Fort McCullen for white supremacy, vote the Democratic Party. That's where the change came. Because I went in the Army as a nuclear weapons officer. As a nuclear weapons officer, seeing that sign, I became a Republican. However, the change was started. And I, I just want to make one more comment on the Republican. I went into the Ford administration uh, from my Army as a special assistant for industry in development of the carcinogen standard. Something happened in the Ford industry, in, in, in the Ford uh, presidency. We started to say, why do we have Black History Week? It should be African American History Month in February. Right. He took it, passed it, and that's where it started, by the Republican president. There's no question. A major change. My grandfather 
was born in 1903. His name was Ernest Roosevelt Blunt, named after President Roosevelt. My, his, my grandmother's sister married a guy named Theodore Roosevelt Ross. So there's no question they were all Republicans. Jackie Roosevelt Robinson. I think it was FDR who started it, but LBJ is the one who cinched that, made that change. So it's not about really the party. Both parties, uh, the uh, boss wants to ask a question. No, nope, you first. Oh. If we could bring it up to the present time. Yes, sir. Uh, less and less people are, are voting and particularly uh, younger people are not voting as much as older people. Out west, they're now doing uh, mail-in voting and, and things like that. Do you think that's going to be the way to have elections? I think so. You know, internet voting, I know my daughter, everything's on these phones, right? How long before you vote on your phone, right? And why not, why is election day, not election week, not you know, election month, right? It's coming, more and more states are adopting it, it's easier, you get more participation that way. I think that's part of the inevitable trend, notwithstanding the effort to restrict the franchise by voter ID laws and these other things, making sure the vote is between eight and six or eight and seven. We're gonna vote over a longer period of time and not, so election day won't be Tuesday, which is a big deal for campaigners, you gotta change your strategy, and then, how long before the Apple, you know, the iPhone is going to be used to vote? It's only a matter of time to me. You know, they say there's, you know, worried about security and all that stuff. That's legitimate, right? You, you don't want me voting for you, so to speak. You got to be careful about how you do it. But it's just a matter of time, I think. Anybody disagree with that? I'm inside with that. Is that okay? Please. It's just a matter of time before technology is going to make voting, right? Instead of having to do an absentee ballot, you can you know, vote by phone, yeah. right? I'd like to point out that Wilson was not only against the black. He put the women suffragettes in jail. Did he really? Uh -huh. And force fed them. Oh, yes. Not a badge of honor, is it? <laughs> he, was, he was a horrendous president. Got but us into but he was our president, don't forget. <laughs> That's interesting, I did woman, not know that. I didn't like him. <laughs> so the, uh, the, the 19th Amendment was 1920, I think, so right after he left the White House. So that's interesting to hear that. So he fought against them, and the reaction to it was, okay. And another thing I would like to ask about is equal protection of the law. We aren't near that. No, we, we aren't, are we? When we consider the, the uh, import of money. I have an old boss. Yes, ma'am. Who was taken to court by one of his associates. Seven years later, he lost in court, and he's still going to appeal. Now, these are guys that have money, both of them, but nothing, of course, not nothing like the one he lost. <laughs> I, I, he could go on forever. I don't know if that's Boy, even money in politics is I a could. big deal, and they, you know, that Citizens United case, I'm living it now. You know what they do now in, in, in mayor's races, and they're looking at it mayor's race. I've seen it happen now. They have what they call independent expenditures for, with money that is unreportable in quantities that you could never give directly to a candidate and you can spend it now on elections because money is free speech 
and you can do it secretly now. So money in politics is going to make, you know, if I, if, please Lord, one day, a rich man, I could decide who's the mayor of any town in New Jersey now if I wanted to by putting money into an independent expenditure to make sure you don't get elected or whatever. And that's not right, is it? It certainly doesn't call for you It doesn't, yes. But the journey is still clear from where we started when it was passed to where we are today. We are moving forward. It's just not smooth and easy, but we're definitely moving in the, in the forward direction, right? We're more equal today, without a doubt, than we were 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, even though we still got a long way to go. How's it? We, yes, it's progress. Considering where you come from. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I, I guess I, I just have a less optimistic view of the, of the future. You're not alone. I see the, um, uh, I, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, I, I don't see the, um, uh, the voter suppression that we're seeing today as a debate. I see it more like a brawl. Mm -hmm. That uh, you have very powerful interests uh, working very hard. They're not interested in convincing anyone. They want to get their, uh, their people elected. And what can change is the uh, loyalty to a party or the situation. Uh, but when the, um, when the Voting Rights Act was ruled unconstitutional, you had six states within a couple of days uh, trying to get out of the restrictions. Uh, to, uh, in, in my view, uh, I see it as voter suppression, pure and simple. I just, uh, I cannot see, for instance, in um, the state of Texas, where uh, uh, you have um, uh, trying to get maybe 100,000 people off the rolls because of maybe 10 demonstrated cases of someone who voted when they shouldn't. To see that as anything but voter suppression, it's not a debate. It's not let's see who's right. It's the, it's the force of money uh, trying to control the democracy. Force of I'm money. Wrong. Trying to control. No, but the, so I'd still say, however, when you look at history, it was much worse in the past. And there are possibilities that even with the force of money, that people who vote can still get their voice heard and can still make changes. It, it's just harder and harder to do while they unleash money on us the way they've done lately. It's kind of shocking, really. Why should I, because I'm rich, be able to decide who the mayor is of any town? It's called free speech. Are you by that? This I was also born in 1960. Really? And when anybody makes the mistake of attributing Woodrow Wilson to the state of New Jersey, I say just what you said, that no, he was a Virginia. He was born in Virginia. But now I have a question. But he was the governor of New Jersey. <laughs> comparing the 2005 gubernatorial election in New Jersey to the 2009 gubernatorial election in New Jersey, there was a big shift in voter turnout. And I know you don't know personally any party bosses, but th those shifts were in um, Essex County, Hudson County, and Mercer County, most notably. Not from one party to another, but from turning out in very high margins for the Democratic candidate in 2005, and not turning out in the same margins in 2009. So how do you explain that shift in New Jersey between 2005 and 2009 when if, right, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a factor of voter suppression? I would attribute to the candidates. 2005 was John Corzine against, who was he running against? Forrester. Doug Forrester. Doug for Jesus, see? It's tough being a loser in politics, isn't it? Doug Forrester, right? In 2009 was Chris Christie's election, is what you're referring to. And he was successful by a variety of devices of reducing that plurality and democratic strongholds, right? And that was an important part of his overall victory. He didn't win 50% of the vote as a Republican in New Jersey. It's a very difficult uphill slog for him, but Corzon only got about 44 to 45%, so that made it possible for him. So my answer would be the candidates themselves in this case, as opposed to something more systematic or even demographic, which we've talked about in the past. I'm not sure if I can stand by that answer under some heavy pressure, but I think that's, that's kind of how I see that. I think that uh, once Christie leaves, 
Well, he, uh, Christie will not run for office in 2017, right? He's done running for governor. That I bet it's probably going to snap back into a more traditional Democrat Republican, where Democrats win Hudson and Essex and Camden by big margins, and Republicans win Morris and Monmouth by big margins. But you know, the other thing underneath that, Peter, is demographics in New Jersey are changing. Our state is now 41% non white and growing. And the voting population is beginning to reflect that. I think we're now in the 67% neighborhood for white voting percentage. And so that, there is a difference between white and non-white voters and behavior. So that's going to also begin to work changes. So the candidates with this inevitable demographic thing going, unless people change their politics, the demographics are going to end up being a tsunami politically for the next Republican candidates, my guess. And my guess is they're going to try to change. And with that, we are going to wrap it up this afternoon and say thank you. I'm sure he can linger for a bit and answer any more questions, but thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.